Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's Friday, October 13, 2017, and we are at the almighty episode 10. Hello, everybody. I am your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as usual, I'm joined by the one and only Chad Owen. 10, Mike. I I didn't think we would make it, but here we are. I know. Did you bring the the champagne and the balloons? Because I I feel like we, we need a party right now. Well, I'll have a beer. You have a you have a espresso or a coffee. That's right. We need to time zone adjust our, our celebrations, and uh, it's certainly something to celebrate this show because we, after our adventure into the world of creativity, of music, of football coaches, we are taking a right hand turn and jumping way back deep into the world of technology of computers, of open source, and uh, I think we have one of the the most heavyweight gurus to decode today. So why don't you share with the uh, our listeners who we've got on today's show? Yeah, someone who has been, you know, around since the beginning of the internet and a vocal, you know, champion and kind of cataloger and decoder uh, of the internet. We are going to listen to and learn from Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media. So I don't know about you, Mike, but when I really got into computers, this was kind of in the 90s as a teenager, I don't know how many of those white books with <laughs> you know, the uh, the ink print uh, crazy animals I had lying around on like HTML and Java and even like basic I had lying around. I, I mean, what about you? I, I, I have a very good memory of uh, some of the books that Tim O'Reilly's company has published. I actually taught myself how to develop in Drupal and build websites using Drupal, which is sort of a more complex version of WordPress, if you will. And I actually uh, used one of the books that his company had published and literally read it from front to back and simultaneously built uh, my own website, which was a quiz application. And um, it was one of the most rewarding experiences, even though I'm not really a native coder, I have to confess. Um, I'm more of a man of the humanities than the zeros and ones. But, oh, my gosh, it was was my great O'Reilly publishing moment. I was ever so proud of myself. What about what about you? Which one was the favorite one of the of Tim's books that you uh, that you worked on? I think it was the basic book. That was kind of my first exposure to the deep innards of computing. You did basic? Um, Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. I got I got started at a pretty early age and it was essentially like a snake game. <laughs> uh, you know, like on the old Nokia phones. Yeah, yeah, um, I remember snake. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean the same thing reading reading the book from from cover to cover. We're certainly dating ourselves in the fact that we learned com- computing from from books but i i mean and almost all of them were from o'reilly publishing or, or, or o'reilly media yes. um just for those of you that aren't familiar with with tim and kind of his history with the internet he published the whole internet user's guide and catalog which was like literally a a book on the internet um it was a, i think not, it was in, a, not in the internet it was about the internet it was yeah. like a <laughs> so, telephone book of the internet right 1992 exactly exactly this is you know kind of pre yahoo pre uh-huh. Uh-huh. Alta Vista, pre Google, all of that, where he listed all of the interesting places on the internet. Yeah, um, and he would later convene many different people for many different reasons. In the late '90s, he kind of organized the meeting where open source software, that idea, was kind of born. Um, he organized also, that. Like, like, let's mm-hmm. be clear. He brought everyone together to define open source. Like. That's pretty major when you think about how many companies such as Amazon and Google and Uber all use open source technologies in their platform stacks. 
Yeah, and then after after the dot com bust, he organized the Web 2.0 conference, and again gave birth to the idea of Web 2.0, uh-huh. um, which you know he saw as a way to revitalize the kind of dead or dying industry. Yeah, and it was scary days then. I don't know if you remember, but uh, I had gone to Amsterdam to do an internet startup in two thousand. And, you know, the stock market crashed. And by 2002, 2003, it was bleak. Like, all the internet projects had died up and gone away. And uh, he single-handedly not only put this conference together, but it actually, much like the the term open source, the term Web 2.0 really captured the next five or six years of internet technologies, really before mobile uh, took over. And he once again was the creator, the instigator of this idea. But the crazy thing is he's done so many other things. We have to talk a little bit about his involvement in the Maker movement. Uh, He was involved in the Maker magazine. There's the Maker Fair, which are huge down there on on the West Coast. And that's like a, I mean, that's a whole movement outside of technology. And have you been to, to one of these Maker Fairs? They are crazy. No, no, but uh, I must say that I'm very curious about dabbling in 3D printing. Uh, that's I think that's going to be my next uh, money sink oh, here wow. pretty soon. Sink away, sink away. Yeah. Um, he also has his own technology firm that does investments, Alpha Tech Ventures, and I won't bore you with the the list of companies isn't that they've invested in, but it's the who's who. So so let's just back up before we get to his latest projects. He he wrote the first catalogue of the internet. He, he was absolutely critical in the coining and the phrasing and the defining of open source software. He, he then went on to define Web 2.0. He, he instigated the maker movement. He has a successful ventures firm. Now, why don't you talk a little bit about what he's doing for, for redefining government in the information age? Tim's a very socially conscious person, and he wants to leverage technology to make everyone's lives better. And he sees one of the best ways to do that is in government. So he created Code for America, which is very similar to the other Blank for Americas, where it's a year-long program, you know, devoted to bringing technology and and innovative software into government and into civic service. Yeah, so uh, you can go, if you just Google Code for America, you'll find that project which is truly having impact on the way government uh, operates in a digital world. So here's an interesting question for you, Chad. Like, if you were to try and think of who else can achieve sort of grandmaster status when it comes to the internet and software and computing. Like, who's up there with Tim O'Reilly? Who who do you put in the same league? Well, he has an interesting vantage point because he didn't found a technology company. He, I think you said it best, he's kind of like the 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 your favorite professor on right. the internet. Yeah. But I think he's been there, you know, since the beginning and has seen the, the founding of uh, of Microsoft and the founding of Google and, and, and Yahoo!, um, I don't know. It, I don't know anyone else that I would maybe put put next to him. I, I think the only person that sits with him as in that grandmaster status is Tim Berners Lee, the the founder, if you will, creator of of the internet. I think these two, mm. almost Tim uh, from the academic side and and Tim from thought leadership side, have created a framework in which Elon. Jeff Bezos, Larry and Sergey, everyone has worked within a construct that I think these two have done. So if there was ever somebody who can inspire us, if there was ever somebody that we can learn uh, something from about the internet, which is really defining out the age in which we live, I think Tim, it truly is the oracle of of Silicon Valley. And uh, I think everyone should just be like 
active listening as they tune into this podcast because there is the clips that we have are, are amazing. The clips are going to uh, cover everything from some real insights he has on a product and technology level right through to some of the, the values uh, that he will challenge all of us to uphold in the way in which we go about creating things in this world. It's really exciting to 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 listen and learn from someone who has this amazing spectrum, right from very functional knowledge to really challenging us uh, on, on how we should behave. It's all drawn from 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 two two interviews that he did. One with Sarah Lacey in last year, and another one from from Stanford in 2013. So there's a lot. There's a lot of goodies to unpack in this show, but uh, I wanted to give it back to you, Chad. You wanted to to say something. Oh, just that I love how he is giving us in these clips that we're going to listen to lots of good practical advice, and it's all kind of towards what he sees as a greater good for kind of society and humanity. And I think these first clips really set that up very well. And this is a theme that I've seen across everything that I've seen him in. You know, we, you and I looked at quite a few interviews to, to pull some clips from. And I think in every single one of them, he talks about this idea of delivering more value than you are capturing mm. in anything and everything that you're doing, whether that's financially or with time and attention in everything. And so here he is just summing up his kind of core tenet, which is, you know, contributing more than you are taking. In any ecosystem, if you take more out than you put in, the ecosystem uh, eventually depletes. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, the, the phrasing actually originally came uh, we, uh, back in 2000. We were having an O'Reilly uh, uh, sort of executive retreat, and I, I laughingly said, you know, uh, you know, I've had more than one internet billionaire tell me that they started their, their company with an O'Reilly book, and, <laughs> and, I, 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 and you know, Basically, they got billions of dollars, and we got thirty-five dollars. <laughs> and and uh, Brian Irwin, who was at the time my you know uh, VP of marketing, said that should be our slogan: "We create more value than we capture." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Companies again and again make that mistake uh, of of trying to say, "Well, we just you know, it's really the growth fallacy of Western civilization in some sense that there is some ability to go on growing forever." Uh, and, and eventually you start consuming your children, you mm -hmm. start consuming your ecosystem, and then, and then innovation goes somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this is really powerful thinking because it really, I think, is the divider between the industrial age and the information age. In the industrial mm. age, we, we're all about secrecy and silos and, and building walls. Whereas the recipe for success in the information age is all about collaboration and sharing. And it's the classic thing of like people not wanting to share their idea because someone will steal it. What he's talking about is get out there, create value, give stuff away, and just don't take more back for yourself because what happens is you end up running out of space and you start as he says eating your children and i think that this this idea of giving more than than you take not only i think helps you on a on a business level because you know giving away ideas and inspiration only brings better things back to you but i think surely that's where legacies really begin is where you gave of yourself more than you took. I mean, I think when Steve Jobs talks about making a dent in the universe, I believe this is the formula in which to do that. What do you What do you think, Chad? Mm. Yeah, I think it's just a beautiful, a, a beautiful model. Like you said, it, ac across all areas of our lives, you know, we're seeing you know some very successful people today kind of realize this too late, mm. like oh you know, I've become really successful and rich and okay, now I have to give back or now I should give back. Right. But I think what's been so fascinating learning from Tim is he embodied this from the very beginning. You know, he instigated the open source software, right. movement, which, which is contributing more than you are taking that that's the, that's a core value of open source, you know, contribution and open source software. And I just love how it has kind of the broader societal impact of, you know, he will, if you listen to other interviews, go on long tangents about 
why all businesses, you know, the, mm -hmm. and the Walmarts of the world and the Apples of the world, not just tech companies, really need to be, you know, giving more than they're taking. Um, yeah. So he, it's it's I think it's a really admirable value to hold and to and to strive for. And he he makes the case that it will just work out for you better in the end, right? Because if you yes. eat all your children and and deplete the ecosystem, then you have nothing left left to give. He he makes the case with Walmart specifically saying that they've driven wages down so much and yet they employ so many people in this country and across the world that their employees can't afford to shop at Walmart. So, <laughs> it, you know, they're like cannibalizing their own sales by not paying their workforce. Exactly. Enough. So that, exactly. And I think, I think what, what's interesting for me is uh, starting to apply this thinking to ourselves and, and trying to inspire our listeners on how they can do it. And I think the first thing I would recommend to everybody is I'm sure everyone listening to the show has an expertise in something. And I would encourage them, I would challenge them to say, when was the last time you just shared that knowledge in order to help other people? When was the last time you just gave away your secret source and just for other people to to practice in this area. And I think you will be amazed that the more of your thinking and your ideas that you give away for free, the more people that quite ironically will ring you up and say, can you come and help me? And I will pay you to come and help me because this is really important to me. So I want to I wanna ask you, Chad, like what else would you think about when invited to, you know, share more than you take where does this naturally take you to like what comes to mind beyond the like sharing of ideas what other things would you recommend to to our listeners if they were gonna share more value than they take i just think it's good business practice to always seek you know a 10x return on whatever investment you know financial or time that you're being given because if you can do that, then you can charge 10 times more than anyone else. It's, it's that, that's the business case. Mm. You know, if you can figure out how to deliver that much more value, you can, it will inevitably lead to you being able to charge more. But I think on a kind of idea and creative level, just the more that we put our ideas out there and share them and teach them, the more that we can refine them and make them better because we have that feedback loop. Mm. If we hold everything too close to the vest, then we're not able to get that feedback and, and, and hone our ideas. And so I think that's another way that this giving more than you're taking is really beneficial. You know, I, I find myself in the trap of consuming a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of audiobooks, and, and I read a lot. I'm trying to flip that equation to where I'm sharing more of what I know and what I've learned to test it, I think, so that I can get more by giving more. Yes, yes. And I, and I, I would really encourage my experience, for example, in, in coaching rugby had, where I have given endless hours of my time to several teams and, and lots of players has been deeply rewarding, um, a very intrinsic personal basis. It's been great for me. It's been great to, to work with the athletes. And I, I can't help but think that creates some, you know, goodwill, some sort of good karma that, I don't know, just makes my life better. And mm. um, I, I can't, I, I imagine that it, that it has an impact on how good I feel in the office and when I'm working. And I'm sure that creates some little halo of goodness that, that follows me. But there's an interesting thought in this, uh, which is that it's not just the sharing of ideas. It's not just talking about it. It's also getting the job done. And this next clip is uh, really speaks to this. This is um, Tim talking a little bit about startups often get things started, but there's more to it than that. So let's have a listen to Tim O'Reilly talking about going beyond just starting something. Well, I guess what I'm thinking is there are, I would guarantee you there are a lot of startups that at bottom are, wow, we can raise some money, we can build something, and then somebody will, you know, will buy it and we'll, we'll be rich and 
we'll move on to something else. Mm-hmm. I mean, how different is that when it really comes down to it from the guys at Wall Street? Oh, we can make this financial instrument. We can sell it to a bunch of people. You know, there are pitches that don't have the kind of conviction that says, I want to work on this you know, for a long time. You know, and great companies really are ones that uh, you know, aren't just startups. Uh, somebody said, we don't need more startups. We need more finish-ups. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I, I think about you know that that notion of, of of you know, I'd love to see more Silicon Valley companies that are set setting out to build an enduring institution. You know, when I started O'Reilly Media, you know, back in the late '70s, you know, people would say, "Well, who do you want to be like?" And I say, "Well, it'd be, you know, if, if I had my druthers, what would be super cool would be to be like." Oxford University still around after mm-hmm. you know twelve hundred years. Mm-hmm. You know, wouldn't that be awesome? You know? mm-hmm. Oxford, I love it. Yeah, he he doesn't have high hopes, does he? he just wants to be around for twelve hundred <laughs> years. Like, come on, how amazing is it? What a contrarian point of view to have when you're in the heart of the technology world, where everyone is short term and, and in a he's hurry. an investor. Yes, yes, he's like. Ah, oh, you know, twelve hundred years. That'd be a good start. That, what did he say? I'd have, I'd have my druthers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love this contrarian point of view. I think my mind goes straight to here. We need more finish ups. You know, when I get very cynical and see, you know, the latest app or startup that's gotten funding, and it's like, do we really need? a subscription green smoothie in a box service? Like, is that really necessary? <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you something uh, that's really interesting, Chad, when you, when you talk about that. Uh, there's this app called Blinklist, right, and, which summarizes books. And, you know, you and I both love learning. So I'm like, literally this week I've been, okay, I'm going to get into this idea of book summaries because – I'm finding it really hard to make time to to get uh, get into books and finish them. So Blinklist, just to set context here, is a fancy app, lots of fancy advertising. I download the app and it is a terrible user experience. And I'm like deeply disappointed because I'm like, I'm, I'm getting in this app and I want to learn. I, I want to devour inside information. I want to trigger my mind to how I can apply this to things. And I'm like trying to search books and the search function's a bit loopy. And then I'm, I'm like trying to go through the, uh, through the book and stumbling on so many user experience uh, points to the point at which I then look for alternatives, and then I find this quite humble, beautifully designed, thoughtful application called InstaRead, and it goes ten times further than Blinklist, but it doesn't have fancy ads. It's not shouting from the rooftop. It's not in a hurry to 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 pay back and liquidate and have this moment of IPO acquisition. They're just making beautiful handcrafted book summaries in audio, in text, even visualizations and little infographics. And to me, the fact that people are still building great, well-crafted product who are building more finish-ups is is really inspiring. And I think what's so amazing is Tim is doing this, yet he's sort of already he's running against the the flow of the entire universe that he's at the center of. I find that such a great characteristic that he can think different in the middle of the storm. What I actually take away from this clip is the comparison he makes between the kind of the excess of the U.S. financial markets and what's happening in Silicon Valley. And I think it is so true. Mm. He, at one point, is you know drawing comparisons between between the two and saying like we actually need to be doing something of of substance yes and we need to be committed to it not just try and take people's money and run away with it and it's i'm i'm not saying that that's what all startups are doing but there's certainly an environment in which you can be rewarded for short term thinking that's right and i think what tim is really trying to to drive home here is maybe you would be better off in taking the 
you know, how can I deliver more value than I extract? And one way of doing that is taking a longer view. And I think that that's why this so nicely kind of builds on on what he's been been sharing. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I spoke about my uh, most recent uh, mobile experience with InstaRead, which was amazing. And that really sets us up to, to a nice little segue into thinking about mobile technology and the job that you have to get done with that. And he has some great thinking about and if you, if you just pause to think and just really listen to this, we're going to unpack it. But I think what he has for us here is actually the formula to why smartphones really are the future of, of computing. So let's have a listen here mm. to, to Tim talking about the potential of, of mobile and how we can think about it. Um, the, the first one is to do less. You know, we hear a lot in the mobile world about how it's a small screen. We hear about how people use mobile devices differently. But there's something that's incredibly important that's going on in mobile that I think we're just beginning to understand. And that is that your mobile device knows so much that you don't have to tell it as much as you used to. Yeah, so, so let's just pick up onto this. What's really happening is a lot of people in the, the world of app design talk about, oh, we've got this beautiful constraint. It's, it's a very small screen, so you're forced into some sort of minimalist approach where you have to reduce a piece of software down to its most essential things, which is true. But what he's alluding to here, I think for anybody who's involved in designing, thinking, and building mobile apps is there's something much bigger that he alludes to here. And that is that the, the device has so many uh, sensors and abilities to capture data that it knows so much more about you. You know, I, I think about my iPhone, it knows my resting heart rate, it knows how much activity I've, uh, I've had during the day, it knows where I'm meant to be next, and it knows all these things at a deep native iOS in the actual device. And because of that, it uh, can do more on my behalf than the traditional personal computer or even the, even the laptop. And so actually what he's alluding to us here is it's the ability for it to know all of this data means that it can do so much more for us so we can do less of some things and create opportunities to do more. And I, I think if we, if we take this in for a moment, it truly is a device that's rich with data that we're only just beginning to, to unpack, whether it's uh, for health and exercise, whether it's for meditation, uh, whether it's for productivity, it doesn't matter. I mean, so there's a lot in, in what he had to say there. When, when you think about the potential of what lays within your smartphone, Chad, w where do you start to go with this thought from, from Tim? The only in and, and knowing that he was saying this in 2013 and before, I'm sure he said it before this this talk at Stanford, is just how f much further we have to go mm. to really capitalize on what he's talking about. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm frustrated in either re-entering information or, it, you know, in some and I understand some people fall at different spots on the privacy spectrum, but there's some things that I don't really care are out there and known in the world. And if they're known and out there and in the world and on my phone, I want, I want to be intelligently enabled, you know, yes. whether that's, you know, my activity schedules or, you know, what I like to eat, or, you know, um, where I like to get my news sources from, et cetera. Right. I, I feel like so many developers haven't quite unlocked that. Yeah, and I the ones yeah, yeah. the ones that are will will be very very successful, and there is still so much potential that is yet untapped. And I'm really excited to see kind of where we're now bringing in artificial intelligence and yes. and the idea of these big data open data stores, like where that is going to go. Right. So so let's let's unpack it for a bit because I think here is I think what you've just done for us is get to where where the opportunity is for anyone who's thinking mm -hmm. about their next mobile app or or software. The real shift, and we're going to get into this uh, later in the show, it's how you work with the data that's collected. We're obviously collecting a lot more data. 
And at the heart of this, you've, you know, you've probably heard of like machine learning and artificial intelligence, or even more classically algorithms. Any of those three things are just tools in which you're trying to process, understand data, and shortcut what would manually for humans take an enormous amount of time to do and try and unlock new value by processing data, generating insights. And when it's at its best is when technology now crunches through the data and not only presents you with an insight, but lets you take action based upon it. And the more of these things that happen without your intervention uh, or, you know, let's say hard work to, to process, this is where the new exponential value of technology is. And actually, Tim speaks to this later on the show. So we have to like stay tuned for that. But this is really the opportunity. So when you think about that spectrum of crunching data, when you think about trying to like create an insight and then produce an action, this is the full spectrum uh, of new opportunities to innovate. And and I think there's a world of possibilities inside this, don't you? Yeah. And there's there's two things that I want to say here. One is Tim follows up talking about this in that the the actual physical mode of using a smartphone is so often hunched over staring at the screen. And I think what he's alluding to is like, how can we put the phone away or keep it in the pocket or have it in a different use case and just, and have it work. You know, everything from, I walk up to my vehicle and it starts and unlocks and starts playing my, my playlist that I was listening to on right. my headphones. Th those kinds of things. I understand there's a lot of hurdles that have to be overcome to make that sort of thing happen, but that's really where I think these opportunities lie in, in to yes. be able to capitalize in this in, in this opportunity. The, the second one is I was just thinking about your, your Blinkist and um, Insta reads example. Like I know Amazon would hate this, but like if you're browsing the Amazon book page yes. and, and Insta read has a summary of that, I would love to know that. And then so that I either get a notification there or I'm back in the Insta read app, it would say, Hey, you looked up this New York times bestseller. We have a summary of that you know, we've already right. downloaded it for you and here you can listen. I, I will, I just want to build on that. In, in this use case of moving towards book summaries, I think what I'm doing is completely reordering how I read. So I have a feeling this is what's emerging like literally this week. I am going to start with book summaries and only if it really excites me, do I go, go and purchase the book. Yeah, I mean that 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 was my call. That was my college uh, tuition, right? I went to, <laughs> I went to a great college institution that has a great books program, so they could tell me the books that I needed to read. <laughs> but you think about it that that that's where uh, technology is is really changing the way we behave. But what what you're speaking to uh, is a journey through this pattern um, of crunching data, producing new insights, and potentially even and presenting new actions, new things to do based on that. And I want you to imagine this is sort of like a loop. This is like an end to end. And uh, what's really powerful uh, in the way Tim thinks is he actually in this next clip is going to outline how we should think about exploiting this loop, how we can actually move through it. And how we can create the most value. So this is the perfect moment for us to listen to Tim O'Reilly talking about closing the loop. Is to close the loop. You know, what makes that Uber experience so different is that you know when your cab is going to. You know, when, when you, let's say you want to go to the airport and you call a cab, you never know. Are they going to show up? Are they close? Uh, you know, did they forget? Uh, you know, you're standing on a street corner in the rain. You don't know how long it's going to be. Think about Uber. You know, you can sit in the restaurant. You can sit in the coffee shop. You get a text when the driver is outside. You know, Uber has closed the loop. Uh, you want to know where they are? You can actually look on the map and you can watch their progress towards your location. You know, Uber has you know, closed the loop. And I got that framing from Chris Saka, who's an early investor 
uh, in Uber. Uh, he was also Google's head of special projects for a long time. And he said, what I learned from Google is to only invest in things that close the loop. So how true is it that once you've ordered your Uber, it's the period between ordering the Uber and getting in it. That's when you're using the app and using, that's when you have the most heightened journey in the experience. Because once you're in, you close your phone and you, you're not, you, you're in, you're on the way. But it's so true. They do close the loop, don't they? Yeah. The, the, the interesting mental model that I have held for a long time, I call it the information gap. There, there's just this natural tension you know, if, if you open this information gap, okay, I ordered a cab, but where is it now? I don't know. I'm worried. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of activates the, the, the lizard brain, the kind of like fight or flight. It's like, oh, I don't know. You know, there's all this uncertainty Yeah. and anything that we can do to close that information gap is like a huge release. And I think actually psychologically and, and chemically, like neurologically, there's like, you know, a, a release of chemical that's kind of like soothing to you. Yes. So, yes. You know, in, although, in way, although there's this one thing, Chad, I have to interrupt you. Do you ever have this thing where you are watching the route that your Uber's taking and thinking, why is he going that way? I'm, <laughs> I always have this thing like, that's not the best way to get here. I mean, that's how small the concern is now. You're now like trying to ESP navigate your driver. Like, what are you going that way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think what what Tim is calling out here is like a very powerful psychological force. And I think others have talked about this in terms of like a viral loop of just if, is, if you can create these kind of reinforcing and reassuring loops, as, as Tim is saying here, you know, closing the loop, it actually makes the experience so much better. And, it does. You know, he's using Uber as kind of, of as an Uber case, if you mm -hmm. will. But I think anyone that is you know designing a user experience should really should really you know take this this model to heart yeah and i would also look at airbnb i think they do an amazing job of closing the loop on staying somewhere and you know they're expanding that into experiences now so i mean i mean world's their oyster if you ask me lots of lots of loop opportunities uh, are swimming around in our universe so let's let's just um, uh, think about some of the some of the cool stuff we've still got coming up. We're we're really going to move into all sorts of mental models about shifts between uh, data and software. We're going to think about you know workflows. But I think what's really exciting uh, is on the, on the other side of the spectrum. Tim's got lots of thoughts on on how we should prioritize our time and the things that that create the most value in the universe. So there's plenty more, plenty more coming up. Now, if you're, you're interested at all on finding uh, the full length interviews that we've taken clips from, you will be able to go to moonshots.io where we'll have fabulous show notes with all the details and all the links there. So, so make sure you go and check that out. Before we get into the new clips, we should showcase Tim's new book, which has literally just come out. I, I think, do we have to confess that neither of us have had the chance to read it yet, Chad? Well, it did come out just two days ago. Oh, that's fair. Fair, fair. It's called WTF, or What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us. And like I said, it just came out two days ago, and Mike and I have not had the chance to read it, but... Hopefully you have learned a lot from Tim thus far on this episode and will be encouraged to go and check it out. Yeah, and I, I would I would think from everything I understand about this one, it's really a positive and inspiring view to the future, which is exactly where Chad and I are coming from. So this is like, you know, going top of my book summary list. Notice that book summary list. This this is really right up our, our alley. And we would really encourage everyone to dig into Tim O'Reilly's uh, work. And if, if a book feels like too much, he's pretty active on, on Twitter. So you'll, you'll find him there as well. But uh, no doubt that'll be a really satisfying read, regardless of how you read it, how you digest it. So yeah, and based on some of the reviews and just from from what I know of Tim, you know, I think he will talk about things like the new gig economy, how artificial intelligence and and machines fit into the new economy, you know, a, a future of work where we're not just being replaced by 
machines or artificial intelligence. You know, these are all things that he has been thinking mm. about for a really long time. Mm. And um, I'm hoping that when I dig into the book, uh, he, he goes into those sorts of things in more depth. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he really has, uh, has a lot to offer. So Tim O'Reilly, what's the future and why it's up to us? So just grab it from your fam favorite uh, source. So now we're going to go and jump into the second half of the, the, the show. And um, what's really interesting is you're already starting to see that whether you're talking about closing the loop on, on a software experience or cr creating more value in the world, Tim's got lots of thinking to, to offer us. So now we're going to go and, and run riot through a bunch of ideas uh, that were really exciting uh, to discover. So let's kick off on a really big theme of his. You know, he talks a lot about value. In this, this next clip, he's going to talk about how we prioritize our efforts and what problems we go out to solve in the world. So let's have a listen to Tim O'Reilly talking about working on stuff that matters. You know, when we uh, started working on the open source movement, it was because we said, hey, this is really important thing that nobody's paying attention to it. But we sold a lot of books because we told a big story that mattered to all those communities, that we made them proud of who they were, that we made the world know who they were. And it was great marketing for us. It was great because we were helping others and we helped our own business. Web 2.0, a lot of people don't realize this, but the reason why we started that marketing campaign was because after the dot-com bust, a lot of our customers were out of work. And we actually had our strategic goal in 2003 to reignite enthusiasm in the computer business. We basically, we went out there and we, we told a big story that was designed to help other people. And it, sure, it, it helped us build our business as well. Uh, you know, clearly I've been doing that in areas like open government. Uh, I'm looking at healthcare. I'm really interested in that. Government, healthcare, open the universe. source software. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just working on everything, guys. What are you guys working on? Building a 1,200-year uh, legacy company. Oh, my yeah, gosh. It, it, it really just drives home. At the core of everything he does is a greater good for... I truly think he has an altruistic business vision. I don't think any of the initiatives he's he started were from selfish or profit-driven motives. And so I think working on stuff that matters is, you know, like a bumper sticker that you could put on the back of his car. <laughs> he, could, he could have the bumper sticker, he can have the flag, he can have it all. You know, I, I think that there's this idea of, you know, doing stuff uh, that matters and, and it sounds good and it makes sense. But I, but I think it's important that we call out some of the reasons, some of the practical value that it creates. For me, any company that is really trying to tackle a big problem, something that really affects a lot of people, will have a much easier job of recruiting people to come work for them. Because in the end, humans are drawn by big, meaningful things. And it, it, I think it's really important to state that, that building a company that's uh, working on a, a really big, meaty, hairy, nasty challenge that could, could actually create positive change for a lot of people will always have a better chance of recruiting great people because the mission will be so, so appealing. Uh, mm. what, what else, Chad, do you see as being like the big benefits to working on stuff that matters? Just feeling good about what you're doing. I think <laughs> right. <laughs> there are a lot of us at times in our lives where we've been, you know, stuck in kind of work that is just not very fulfilling. And there's a time and a place for that work. But I think if you're entrepreneurial, like you and I, and m most of our listeners, I think that that's something that you shouldn't forget about is doing work on stuff that matters. And that could mean, you know, solving a big business or economic challenge. It could mean mm -hmm. solving a social challenge um, or, you know, uh, I mean, any number of ways. But I think this idea of, of purpose is, of course, you know, uh, coming to the forefront, especially like you said, in, in recruitment and retention mm. um, for, for large companies today. 
I've, I've got one other that I'd like to add to this, Chad. Let, let me try this one out on you. I also have this idea that working on big stuff presents a very practical opportunity for new businesses and products. So think about it like this. If you're trying to solve this big problem, like make, make uh, young people more healthier, you know, create support services for rich and rewarding lives for retirees, doesn't matter. If you're tackling something really big like this, what's really interesting is that 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 universe is going to be full of lots of different areas of interest, lots of different user cases. So if you're going out trying to solve something really big and you fail the first time, you'll often discover that there are other problems that maybe you can solve or you move on, you tried on A and B, now you're trying on C because the space, if you will, the industry vertical is so big, there's lots of room to move around in it. Whereas if you're actually working on something really, really, really small and not of great consequence, it's sort of such a narrow niche that it's sort of, well, if you can't get that done, there's not much else in the space. So I think mm -hmm. that if you want to like de-risk your enterprise, go after a big and profound problem because there will be so many parts to that problem that maybe you end up solving a different part of the problem than that to which you started out with. And that's the other huge advantage to working on big stuff. So what, what, what do you think of this idea? Can you see how, how that can create new possibilities and, and sort of a backup plan, if you will? Well, I think what you're saying, Mike, is that we should take moonshots Aye. because if we <laughs> if there we, you go if we if we if we miss then uh then the problem space is is so large that we will st inevitably stumble into a problem you know that we can solve or mm. maybe have already mm. solved absolutely i I, I, lo I love that idea yeah and and i i think you know when you think about things that were in huge need of reinvention that uh you know the way that we get connected to the right products and services, the way in which we get the right technology in our lives is 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 a big thing in in modern life. And what's really interesting is um, Tim has this great thinking about how to reimagine workflows. So if you're starting on a new company, he's like, reimagine a workflow, a de facto standard in which something is happening and challenge it. And so this next clip is his advice, and he has some great examples here on how you can rethink workflows. So let's ha have a listen to Tim's thoughts. Uh, but another place where you see this, also in a retail context, is in the Apple Store. I mean, how amazing is the Apple Store? You go into a typical retailer, you can't find a salesperson to save your life. You know, and instead, you know, what Apple has done is they've given all these, uh, uh, they, they've, they've taken that cash register workflow and totally decomposed it so that everybody who works for Apple in the store can check you out. Uh, they can check inventory. They've turned them into augmented humans with superpowers. You know, so you have, instead of no clerks, you know, here's automation you know, creating more clerks and making it an extraordinarily profitable uh, store. So rethinking workflow with, what did he call them? Augmented humans. <laughs> so what was that? <laughs> uh, well, that, that's where he, that's his positive view of artificial intelligence and computing and technology enabling and enhancing the workforce. Right. You know, so it's actually not replacing people. It's actually putting more cashiers to work, in fact, now, because everyone can be a, a, a stock person and an inform, you know, know everything about the products and can check you out. Mm. Mm. Well, you know, and I think we should unpack this a little bit. So one key thing for everyone to understand is Apple has not only uh, built one of the best supply chains in the universe, they've not only built some of the most beautiful and profitable products in the world, they have also built the most profitable per square foot retail space in the universe. Like nobody mm. per square foot sells as much stuff as Apple. And they have done this by reimagining, like the Genius Bar was a big part of it. 
the design and what he's quite rightly pointed out, it's a fabulous point, is he they have armed it with all these fresh, hip, young-looking millennials with their bright-coloured tees, but it's actually what they're armed with, which is an iPhone and like a Stripe card to check you out so everyone can check you out rather than the traditional have to go to the cashier. And by just rethinking, reimagining that workflow, they have become the best retailer in the universe. I'm sitting here trying to think how how you or I could rethink an existing workflow of ours in a similar way. Oh my gosh. Yeah, th- th- that's a very interesting experiment that I'm going to I'm going to run away with because I mean you're right. Just Apple does so many things right and retail is one of them. I'm I'm just like imagining my last experience at Best Buy which was Hor- horrific. Um, <laughs> well, it's fun, which like, is I never, I never want to go there despite its convenience to I where know, I live. I and I, I will always like go several blocks, if not half a mile out of my way to go into an Apple store <laughs> just know. to check out the latest things, not even necessarily to buy anything. Yeah. So I, I think about two things in my life that I've encountered, which felt ridiculous. One is The process of getting a mortgage and dealing with banks, that is a workflow that is in dire need of some fixing. I think another one, uh, you know, and, and this is particularly important for most of us who have families and stuff like that, is healthcare. Healthcare mm. seems to be riddled with so much paper. It's like everything is a barrier whether it's the getting insured, going to your general practitioner, getting to see a specialist. I mean, this seems no matter which of the four countries I've lived in, no one's really got it dialed. So those are two areas that instantly come to to my mind. And I would just say to to our listeners, I would challenge them and say, if your company has a, a support or help desk experience, I would just challenge you, go have a look at that workflow and see if you, are you really doing the best you can to support your customers? Are you giving them every single thing they could possibly need to be successful? And I think you'll probably find there's some workflows there that can get fixing. But let's think about I think yours. I, got, I think I got mine. Yeah, I think I, think I got it. It, it. I think it would have to be my client onboarding process. Yeah. Uh, which is non-existent at the moment. <laughs> so I think... <laughs> Yeah, the idea of kind of stepping into my clients' shoes and understanding what would be most helpful for them. Yes. I, you know, I'm just thinking, like, how can I make this an Apple experience? It's going to be a really interesting couple of hours thinking through that. So, yeah, yeah. I've, I've already got some ideas cooking. Okay, so so let's keep going on this line a bit because what you would want to do is you would actually want to validate, you want to test and learn what that journey looks like with your customer. So you have an assumption about what that looks like. So what you'd want to do is you'd actually want to get a, a client that you've worked with recently and get them to draw or write down that process as they saw it with no Mm. aid from you. Just let them Mm. define that process as it is to them. Now, what might be interesting, you're a storyteller, so you might see it very much through narrative and, and, you know, getting the ingredients you need to go tell the story. But they might be thinking about it purely from a time perspective because they have a big deadline. Now, that's a great example of two people coming at a workflow from totally different uh, Uh, points of view. What your job is, is to go and understand it from their point of view, because the system really needs to support them. And you have to do the work of integrating that invisibly into your workflow and the back end. So I think Mm. rethinking workflows always starts with empathy for your customer and looking at it through their their view, through their lens. And then it all kind of goes from there. You then start using a vocabulary, choosing the right channels, they might be uncomfortable doing it on mobile. It might be some uh, desktop experience. Maybe they need to have a face-to-face before anything happens because right. they see you as a practitioner of the dark arts. They're, they don't know much about storytelling. They just like the product at the end. They don't know how the sausage gets made. So maybe they need that, that face-to-face uh, sit-down to kick things off. That, that could, I could easily imagine that. Yeah, I, my, my ideas are already are already going. I'm I'm thinking how I can test this out with my my next new nice. my next new client. Nice. So, we've got we've got some uh thoughts uh from Tim on data which I found 
pretty exciting. What did you think about his thoughts on data versus software? Well, I think, wasn't it Brad Feld who said software or no, um, Fred Wilson, software is eating the world. Ah, uh, I might be getting them confused. Uh, it was Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz. Oh, you're right. It was Mark Andreessen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Founder of Netscape said software is eating the world. Uh, I think we have a thought this is, from Tim well, this, that's challenging that. Well, exactly. That's why this was, was so refreshing. Um, so I'll just let him uh, speak and then we can talk about it. I realized that open source software and open protocols of the internet were going to make software as it was less valuable and something else would become valuable when that became commoditized. And I came to the conclusion it was data. And you know, so that was really what distinguished companies like Google or for that matter Amazon uh, from the previous generation of software companies. Yeah, so he's, he's putting data on a higher tier than software, which I think we're seeing the results of actually in the marketplace. Mm. 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 Abs abs absolutely. And it's a little contrarian because I do agree that, 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 you know, obviously Amazon and Google are, you know, equally software and, and data companies. But I think... They're, um, they're data platforms. I yeah. think... I, I think that's a, maybe a better way to conceive of them and what maybe why they've been so successful for so long was it kind of started with software, but actually the values in the data. I think that's what Tim's saying here. It is. And it goes back to, to that idea that we were kicking around earlier, which is, you know, the mobile, capture, mobile device captures all this data. So it's the opportunity for it to process data, get some insights, and then even, you know, help users take actions based on that that's really the power of, of, of data and i think what what you can only expect it sounds probably very logical is that, that we're just going to be swamped in data so we, we're going to be moving into an era where it's all about managing or even perhaps coping with data but the best the best services and products of the future i think are those that are going to help us get the most out of the data. And so mm -hmm. you can think about so many parts of your life now that have data as a component. And it's going to be less about capturing and crunching the data and the, the, the services of tomorrow, the products of tomorrow are going to be doing something with the data and doing it for you so you don't have to process it because naturally mm -hmm. computers can do it a 10 times better than humans. So when you think about a future where it's about data insights and data actions, what comes to your mind, Chad? I don't know. One, one interesting thing to me is just because I'm doing some experimentation is like around nutrition and diet and like when you eat and how much you eat and what you eat. Mm. And mm. I, I think that that has such a huge impact on your health that as we're getting more data and we're understanding more about the correlations, you know, I would just love, you know, if there, if Whole Foods slash Amazon knew what I was ordering and eating and kind of when, mm -hmm. then it could help me just do it in a more optimized way. Like say I'm really active and I need more calories because I'm training for an event because mm. it knows that because mm. well, I'm not on social media, but if I were, it would know that, you know, I'm training <laughs> for a race or it's seen that I've registered for this race or it yeah. knows that, you know, I have this like beach party or whatever right. that I'm going to and I need to, you know, shed a few pounds. That That's one thing that I think there's been a lot of playing around in the health and fitness space, but I haven't seen very many concrete, yeah. like visceral benefits to it yet. Yeah. I think it's because it's a little too disparate. It is. And, and I, I worked on a um, health and quantified self product and uh, it was hardware and software. And um, really fascinating was that in the end of the day, people are not that excited about showing data about how their body and health and uh, exercise is doing. It, it, it really becomes magical when there are natural, automated, smart, actions that the device helps you take based on that data so if we just present a user with data the 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 first thing that the user does is go okay now what do i do so you have to you have to go and close that out which is interesting because it comes to this back to this other idea of closing the loop 
And, mm. and that's a really good example of, of closing the loop so the user goes N, A to Z in the experience, end to end, and, and the, the, the journey is complete. And this is, this is sort of combining two of Tim's thoughts together, but you do actually kind of really start to get this clear picture. And there's this one area in the world that, that, that Tim is consumed with that if there was loops, it almost never closes the loop and it's government. <laughs> I can't tell you. Yes. Oh, my Lord. No matter where you are in the world, whether you're in California or whether you're in Sydney, Australia, uh, dealing with government is often challenging when it comes down to permits for a house, taxes, driver's licenses, you name it, there are a lot of loops left wide open. But um, Mr. Tim O'Reilly has some pretty powerful thinking for us and he's created, a, he's the chairman and he's on the board and he's been supporting the founder of a great initiative called Code for America. And so he's single-handedly building this, uh, this team to go out and change the way government works in America. So let's have a listen to Tim talking about Code for America. It's so important that we fix government because it's a third of our big friggin' economy. And as we saw with the failure of healthcare.gov, it's really broken. And you know, we have all these people with good intentions. You know, that's what I really discovered when I went to Washington. You have people with good intentions, and they can't actually execute on their good intentions because they are so bound in this you know, system that needs to be broken. And unlike you know, uh, the, the uh, companies in the private sector who can be disrupted by new entrants, it's very hard for government to be disrupted without a revolution. Mm -hmm. So we actually ha have to tackle that. Such a surprising clip, such a good clip. The end of it, I think, was my favorite part, saying that government can't be disrupted without a revolution. I know, and I know. It really goes to show like how static and stagnant government can be, which is why an initiative like Code for America is so encouraging. It is, and didn't it blow your mind that government is a third of the economy in America? Uh, I, I don't even want to get into how much America spends on on defense, but yeah, it's it's actually not that surprising. Oh my when gosh! You think of that. I know. I know the numbers ridiculous. If you take healthcare and defense, which are the two biggest budget items, I know that the number is like way off the the, the charts. Trillions. Not, yeah, Trillions. I, I, I think it's like close to two. But the uh, I think Medicare alone is is one point three trillion. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my god. He he has an example where Oracle went to a I think a local government and said, "Okay, here's our solution. It's 13 million dollars." And the the procurer knew about databases and database systems and was like, "No, this is worth 1 million." And then I think they settled at one and a half million, but it just goes to show like the inefficiencies in the uh in the governmental uh, space be because yeah. there's no there's no open competition you yeah. know like all of us that are out there trying to build our own things we're competing against ourselves because we're in the free and open market it, yeah it's not really the same same in government yeah so, accountability huh yeah and and this is tim putting he's walking the talk here he is providing more value than he's capturing and he's working on something that matters to everyone right because we're all in a government of some form or fashion yeah and and how inspiring is it it's a guy that has like made the first catalog of the internet pivotal in the creation of open source software defined the web in the 2000s with web 2.0 created you know, the maker movement has a a, a prestigious uh, venture firm and now he's just going to solve government like what a rap sheet like what an amazing spread of accomplishments and, and mission driven guy like Wow, I, I find that inspiring just to see the scope of what he's trying to contribute. Yeah, I, I am going to pick up his book. I mean, I, I'm going to order it on, on Amazon as soon as we, we get off the, the call here. It, it's one of my favorite things about him is really, I had no idea kind of how socially conscious he was in everything that, that, that he's doing. But if you look at everything that he's done, it's, it's rooted in that in that idealism and, 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 and fighting for a greater good. And so this, this last clip I think is just a great 
summation of, of Tim and his philosophy and his outlook on life. So here is our final clip, Tim's parting words for us this evening. People love to be challenged with idealism. They love to be challenged to do stuff that matters. And so in the last, you know, ever since I gave that talk, I've really just been focusing on that. Just like, I don't care what you do. Do something that matters to you more than money. Now, that's a great way to succeed, but even if you don't succeed, the world will be in a better place. And, and that's what you should think of as an entrepreneur. And you should think about working on things that are hard. Remember that what we fight with is so small, and when we win, it makes us small. You know, find hard problems. <laughs> I, I've never uh, uh, thought about the other side of going big, which is like if you solve small things, it just makes you small. But it's like what a neat little idea that one was. Yeah. Hard problems that matter. Solve hard problems that matter. I think right. that's a great mantra for all of us to take forward in, in our work. Yeah, and, and the, the, the challenge I would put – to everyone is that regardless of what business you think you're in, I am sure that you're part of a bigger story for positive change. And I would, I would challenge everyone to go out and, and take some of these amazing little bits of wisdom from Tim about creating more value than they take closing the loop like it's almost an entrepreneur's end-to-end -end tip book isn't it <laughs> you, mm. you know more finish ups work on stuff that matters reimagine workflows actually if you start to look at what we've been able to pull together this show that really is a comprehensive list of wisdom that you can employ to create a company that that really is a force for good isn't it yeah, and from such an interesting perspective, again, he didn't start a tech startup. He started he started so many kind of grassroots, community-driven groups and organizations and ran uh, kind of a media empire that is essentially just giving away, like he said, he's giving away billion-dollar ideas in a $35 book. book. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and how he, he's so at ease with that. He's like, ah. Oh, isn't this funny? We charge 35 and they, they make 35 million. Ho, ho, ho. Like it's just <laughs> jovial and it's almost mission accomplished <laughs> for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to, uh, to dislike him. That's for sure. Mm. But uh, I just wanted to, again, ask you, Mike, there are so many great tips here. What's, what's one thing that's got your mind cooking that you're going to take into this weekend and next week and, mm. and, and noodle on? Will you let me choose two? Am I allowed? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. I, I think I can't uh, move off that the thought of creating more value than, than you take because that's probably been in my career thus far one of the biggest learnings. I probably was uh, more on the, the – particularly on the not giving away your ideas kind mm. of uh, that, that kind of thing. And I've just loved the idea of – giving away your ideas, sharing with others, making this show with you is all part of that. In, in fact, giving away uh, these ideas, this formula for innovation, this formula for moonshots to our listeners is deeply rewarding for me. Mm. Um, so that, that one has been reinforced. And if I, if I go to a more pragmatic product design kind of thing – I, I really like the rethinking workflows. Me too. If re yeah, if there's something in that that just there's so much crap that just doesn't work properly. So just go fix it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's the one that's got my 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 gears turning for sure. Yeah. That and and kind of where he closed um I'm I'm paraphrasing but you know, solve hard problems that matter. Mm. I think that's that's a great a great mission mm. <laughs> for myself going forward. It is, it is. And and I think what's important is there's a lot of follow-up work for our listeners on this. If any of these ideas oh. have spiked your mind, please go and check out the the show notes because we'll have a ton of links there. You know, obviously to the book, but to to the to the video interviews that we pulled these clips from. And we'll have lots of other links with goodies uh, from, from the show. And you'll find 
all of those at, at moonshots.io. And uh, you'll find lots of other uh, little goodies on the site as well. And I think, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of shy and we, we need a positive reinforcement, Chad. So I think we need yes, to remind folks. go on folks, iTunes, mm-hmm. leave us a review. Mm-hmm. You don't have to give us a five-star review, but uh, we do want to hear and know that you listeners are out there and enjoying the show. Those of you that I have connected with, it's been great to get your feedback. Mike and I are incorporating that right into the show, everything that you're sharing with me. And, you know, I just wanted to give a shout out to our, our global audience. We have people in your neck of the woods in Australia. We have people in Northern Europe. We have people here in the States, Eastern Europe. I'm, I'm just so thankful and grateful for all of you kind of going on this journey with Mike and myself, um, hopefully as we share more than we take back um, all we're asking is just, you know, for your feedback and, and to let us know what you think of the show. Right. Abs- absolutely. And um, which brings me uh, to, to our last order of uh, business, Chad, which seems to be uh, some thoughts about who, who and where we go on the next episode of the Moonshots podcast. Uh, Tim is a hard act to follow. I, I feel like we've got to do some some sort of pivoting because it would just be unfair to anyone similar to him <laughs> trying to compare to that wisdom. Who's who's tickling your mind? I kind of like uh, we we've we've not done Apple yet. Obviously, the big one would be to do Steve. I've got some biggies for Steve, but I'm not ready to do him yet. I'm wondering, what about Angela Irons, the, the head of retail who was formerly CEO of Burberry, but she moved to Apple. She's a really smart cookie. That She could be great to do. Yeah, some I have just seen more and more of Ariana Huffington mm. in, in the news lately, and I think she's doing some really interesting things, especially being on the board of Uber. Wonder how she feels about that idea because she literally joined just before the whole thing imploded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But also, um, Bill Gates. I think. <sighs> yeah, he's, he's another big one, and I just, I think where he is in his life right now, True. I think that we could we could get some really interesting ideas to be able to share with our audience just because of where he began and mm. then kind of where he's been really for like the last 10 years, you know, he, he's, he's been able to be removed and I think have a different perspective on the, the new tech world he helped create. Um, so I'd be very, very curious to dive in and, and see what he has to say. Oh yeah. I love, I love that idea because obviously he has not only Microsoft, but the foundation. He's done great work there. And what's really cool is his wife has been very involved in that. So I'm liking a lot of that. So I, I, I mean, yeah, I think you may have just hit the nail on the head. Um, the when one we thing can do I, Melinda and her own show, even I, I feel like, I, yeah, she gets her own show. Yeah. I actually think you're right there. The other thing to keep in mind is there is one of the all time greatest tech interviews ever, which was Recode, uh, who, who we love, I've used some of their, uh, interviews previously. They managed to get Bill Gates and Steve Jobs on stage together in an interview. Mm. And I've it only is, seen clips from that. I, I will have to watch the whole thing. Oh my gosh, it's so good. So, so we got we got plenty there. I'm also thinking down the track. There's a number of great uh, investors: Peter Thiel, Paul Graham, Sam Altman, Chris Sucker, who was mentioned on this show today. Mark uh, Andreessen. Mark Andreessen. Those guys are good. There's some tech founders. Oh, you see Larry and Sergey. Mark Benioff from Salesforce. Hmm. Jack Dorsey from Twitter. We got some good peeps. The other one we should consider doing is Stacy Brown Philpot, who is the CEO of Task Rabbit, which just got acquired by IKEA. Oh, right. Yeah. That would be a that would be a good one. Yeah. So lots of goodies for everyone uh to listen to um in the coming Listeners, week. if you have an opinion, please yes. let us know. We can yes. throw out a lot of names. And we need a big list because it has to last us twelve hundred years, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, at this rate, we'll need, yeah, like 10,000 10, people yeah. to go 1,200 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
so that's that's a that's a, a wrap i think for for the show uh, a deep and meaningful uh hug across the universe to all our listeners we really do appreciate all your feedback your likes your clicks your listens please come get to know us on moonshots.io we're going to have a great show uh, next week really looking forward to that so for me chad um i've i'm once we finish recording i'm straight down to to the gym what's next in your part of the part of the woods it must be almost, almost be uh, dinner time i would imagine oh yes my wife uh, has dinner waiting i will be walking home from my office with the dog Speaking of wives, I just wanted to give a shout out to Bridie, who is uh, doing lots of wonderful things behind the scenes for Moonshot. So thank you. It's a team effort. It's a team effort here at Team Moonshot. Well, uh, you have a wonderful afternoon, Mike, and uh, I will speak to you next time. Okay, Chad. Thanks a lot. And goodbye, everyone. And we'll see you next show.